Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gut of the prison of the grave. It happened in a place called Bay City, where I was unwelcome to a fat fry cook with a secret and a depa gambler. But to the long arm of the law, I was poisoned. It happened like this. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Long Arm. I got my Sunday best on Going strutting with Miss Laura Belly. Oh, fine. Every time I take a shower, I've never seen it. All right. Okay. <laughs> Hello. This is Philip Marlowe, please. Yes, yeah, speaking. One moment, please, sir. Bay City is calling. Bay City. Where I have your party, called? sir. Go ahead, sir. Hello, is that you, Marlowe? Yeah. This is Ernie Parch, Phil, at Bay City. Parch? Yeah, you remember me, don't you? No, I can't see. Oh, yeah, yeah, Ernie Potts. You're the guy who saved my life when the Bay City Law left me beat up and bleeding all over the city dump, right? Yeah, 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 that's it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Marlowe, please, listen. What? I'm in an awful jam. Like what? I just got out of jail yesterday. A year and a day. Jail, Ernie? Yeah, yeah, a very neat frame, Phil, but... Oh? Not half as neat as the one that's trying to hang on me now. This one's worse. You remember my wife, don't you? Grace, tall, blonde... Yeah, yeah, what about her? She's dead, Marlowe. Oh, no. She was murdered. They're going to try to pin it on me. You'll come right away, huh? Well, look, Ernie, I, I'm poisoned in Bay City. You know that. But please. Rakes Thurman would give a year's pay just to watch me break an arm. Five if I drown. But, Marlo, you don't know it was Thurman who had you messed up for sticking your nose into Bay City politics? No, no, but I can sure second guess it. It was tough cop but... tactics all the way. Then you mean you won't help me? Yeah, well, Ernie, really, I'm sorry, kid, but you better get yourself an honest lawyer and... In and... Bay City? You know better than that, Phil. Who'd have the guts to knock heads with the police in this town? Especially when they got a custom-tailored pigeon like me standing by with one wing already clipped. Phil, I tell you, it looks like I murdered Grace. Yeah, now look, kid. Phil, I... I saved your life once. Okay. What's your address, Ernie? It's 38 Orlando Drive. <laughs> City was a snug seacoast town some 20 miles southwest of L.A. and about twice that distance from being on the up and up. Its string of gambling houses were politely winked at by some elements of the law and its gamblers in turn politely winked back while the folding money passed from sucker to slicker to crooked cop. But Bay City also was home to a lot of honest fishermen, retired real estate brokers and another element of the law, good cops. Which side Detective Lieutenant Rake Sturman was on, I'd never been able to figure. He only added one way, all cop, morning, noon, and night. The kind who made any private detective feel a little less welcome than a leper. Well, an hour after dark, I pulled up and parked well away from 38 Orlando Street. Five minutes later, I was watching a nervous Ernie Parch wear out the carpet in his shabby living room. It was... It was at Art Manelli's place, Phil, about a year ago. The little casino. It's out north on the edge of town. Uh-huh. I've had a few drinks with some of the guys who worked at my gas station. One thing led to another, and well, finally, we were out there trying to pyramid 50 bucks into 50,000. That's when the cops came in, huh? Yeah, yeah. You know, one of those pre-election raids that look good in the papers. You want a drink? Sir? No, no, thanks. But look, that raid couldn't have gotten you a year and a day, Ernie. No, no. But the gun they found in my top coat pocket could have. Mm-hmm. And did. Yeah, 38 I'd never seen before in my life. Plant, huh? Yeah, a plant that I could only figure two ways, Phil. Either someone at Art Manelli's place just happened to choose my pocket to drop his gun into, or, or someone just happened to drop it in on purpose. Someone who was sweet on grace and wanted me out of the way. Now, look, you're sure you know what you're saying, Ernie? I'm positive. 366 days in prison with only one miserable letter from her convinced me. That and the word I got at Gumbo's place late this afternoon. Gumbo's place? Yeah, yeah, Gumbo's shanty. Uh, the chicken joint run by a fat fry cook named Lou Gumborski. Hmm. Grace worked there. I, 
I stopped in just before I ran into Lieutenant Rake Sturman. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What do you mean, ran into Sturman? What happened? Well, Phil, I... I was on the street getting into my sedan, you see? Yeah. I picked it up from a guy who was using it while I was away. When Sturman pulled up alongside of me in a squad car, and he... He started to tell me how much he liked seeing ex-cons back in Bay City. What interrupted him? Oh, well, call on a police radio. But before he left, he promised to drop around here sometime tonight and chat a while. Mm-hmm. And before that, at Gumbo's place? I found Grace. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. I... You've had enough, Ernie. No. You found Grace in what? We had a fight. She admitted running around, said I wasn't worth waiting for. But she wouldn't say who was. I slapped her. Hard. All right, take it easy. Grace is dead now, murdered, remember? Yeah. Yeah, she's dead. Yeah, and they're going to tag me for it. Maybe. Now, tell me what happened after you left Gumbo's. Uh... I ran into Sturman, like I said. Yeah. Then I drove around for a couple hours to cool off. When I got hold of myself, I... I came back here and... I found it. Strangled a bit. In that chair, Phil. It was horrible. What'd you do about it, Ernie? I... I I'm not sure exactly. I, here. I, I changed my mind. Thanks, Phil. <clears throat> no. I... I decided to get her out of here. It was just getting dark, so I, I waited a little, and then and I carried her down the rear stairs, and I put her in my car, in the back seat. I put a blanket over her. She's still there, Phil. I was going to drive the car away, but, well, I, I, I guess I, I lost my nerve. What am I going to do, Phil? Sturman might be here any minute. Then you got to help me. You must have... Ernie, you Ernie, that won't do it. Sorry, I... All right, kid. Are the keys in the car? No, no, no. I, I got them here. What are you going to do? I don't know. But you get out of here. Do something. But what, Phil? Anything. Go to a movie. Act as relaxed as you can. Do anything. Except come back here for the, at least two hours. Now go on. All right. All right, Phil. Whatever you say, I, I'll go to a movie. Yeah, right now. Right away. Thanks, Phil. I know you'll get me out of this. Ernie Parch's vote of confidence made comfortable listening for both of us. When he was gone and I was down the rear stairs and out to his car in the alley, keys in hand, I realized that it stopped right there in the back seat. Then in the light that spilled from a nearby unshaded window, I saw I was going to have company. Sharp pointed elevator shoes, careful blue flannel, and patent with the hair over a pasty face. All of it no more than five and a half feet and held together by a hand painted tie that sported a dapper knot the size of a cantaloupe. Good evening. I wonder if you could help me. I'm looking for Ernie Parch, uh, 36 Orlando Drive. I couldn't find any number on this house, is it? Yeah, but Parch isn't in. He just left. Oh. You know where he went? No, no. <laughs> it's all right, Cordes. I only want to talk to him. My name is Art Minnelli. I'm a friend of his. Uh, an acquaintance. You? The same, yeah. He went to a movie, Mr. Minnelli. I saw the picture, so I'm going home, back to San Diego. I live there. Oh, good. San Diego means U.S. 101 to the south, right past my next stop. I came in a cab, or don't those keys in your hand there say that you're leaving? I mean, I don't want to appear presumptuous. Or wait for a taxi. Or wait for a taxi. Mm. Shall I get in, or do you want to slide over to the driver's seat from here? Uh, I want to slide, uh, if that's all right with you. Mm, perfectly. Um, tell me, Mr. Um, Crew Shutter. Yeah. You had business with Ernie? Personal business. You, Mr. Manelli? Yes, I wanted to see Ernie about a good location I have in mind for a new gas station. You know about such things? Uh, no, no, and I don't think you do either, Manelli. Unless, of course, the pumps can be converted into roulette wheels. Oh, you know who I am, eh? Yeah. I also know it's a little strange for you to show up at Ernie's place the day after he gets out of the state pen for a frame that took place at your little casino. What are you getting at, Mr. Crewshutter? An outside chance that you yourself were responsible for that frame? That you're anxious to see what, if anything, Ernie intends to do about it? The light's red, Crewshutter. No fool. Now, tell me. Uh, why would I want to frame Ernie Park? I don't know. Could be, Manelli, that you did it accidentally, you know, a little gun hidden in a big hurry. Or it could be you had a tighter reason, huh? Like what? Like Grace Parch, very pretty girl. You're out of your mind. Yeah, yeah, sure I am, Manelli. Just plain nuts. So why don't you get out here? 
Get a couple of nice sane taxi cab. It'll be safer. All right. Just as you say. Uh-huh. Hey, Master, me and my pal in the lift going toward the highway. Sure he is. I ain't smoke. Come on, Norm. We'll ride in the back seat. No, I got stuff in there. Close that door and beat it. Oh, okay, Happy. Thanks a lot. Stop, Mr. Crusader. What kind of stuff? Rum, Manelli. I'm a bootlegger who never got the word, believe me. Oh, but I do. <laughs> the light green, Mr. Crusader. So long. I went three short blocks, then I got out of the traffic and drove as far back toward Orlando Street as a vacant lot that was only a block away from Ernie's. There, after I wiped the wheel, the gear shift, everything else I touched, clean prints. I left the sedan as is and walked back to where I originally parked my own car. Behind the wheel of my coupe, I spent the next 20 minutes finding Gumbo Shanty, where Grace Park was in Daddy Longlegs, standing knee-deep in the Pacific Ocean and circled at the waist by an imitation ship's deck for summertime outdoor eating. A gangplank led up from the street level, and when I'd gone about half the length of it, I saw something at the door ahead, shaped like a bowling pin topped by a chef's hat and encompassed by a yard and a half of Hickok belt that said, this had to be fat fry cook Lou Gumborski. He was turning the reversible sign from open to close. Sorry, mister, I'm closing early tonight. Food's all gone. All right, how about a drink? I only want a quick shot, Gumbo. Gumbo? You're a stranger here. How you know the name? Well, it's written overhead in four-foot letters. I keep my eyes open. Okay. Go on in. Make it fast. I want to hit the hay. Now, you live here? Yeah. What do you want? Scott. Anything with it? A little information. Oh, uh-huh. about what? Girl who works for you, Grace Parch. I don't know anything about it. Mm. Not even for five, Gumbo? Make it ten. Okay, ten. And the drink's on the house, huh? <laughs> hey, okay, mister. Grace Parch is five foot two, eyes are blue. Also, she could work at six tonight like she does every night, period. Uh-huh. Here's to you. <clears throat> now, tell me, where's she been going while Ernie's been in stir? For another ten? Yeah, for another ten. On one condition, no more lousy poems, Gumbo. Just a few straight facts, huh? Sure. <laughs> sure. Uh-huh. Another drink? No, no, no. Facts first. Where's she been hanging around? A little casino. That's Manelli's joint, huh? Yeah, Manelli's place, where a lot of people hang out. What is it? What are you staring at, Gumbo? The window, eh? I thought I saw someone out there on a dick looking in. Probably seagulls. Forget it. Now, look, I'd like to know... Sure, sure, it is someone. Get away in a car. Oh, any idea who it was? Huh? I said any idea... I heard you. Now, go on home, mister. Get out of here. Take it easy, big guy. You got 20 bucks. Give it. Yeah. Here's your lousy 20 bucks and the drinks on the house and good night. After one question. The guy in that car that just took off, was it Manelli? I'll repeat myself. Good night, mister. Okay. Let it go at good night, Gumbo, but just for now. get any more out of gumbo, so I went back to my car, pointed it north toward the edge of town in the little casino where I figured I might get a lead on Manelli's whereabouts. But Thirty minutes later, when I was there out of my car and standing in front of what looked like an oversized concrete blockhouse alone in a parking lot the size of the Coliseum, I figured different. A huge sign out front read, Closed for alterations will reopen soon, bigger and better than ever. <laughs> Gambling in Bay City was obviously on the QT like an artillery barrage. By the time I got back to 38 Orlando Street, nearly three hours had gone by since I'd last seen Ernie. As I started up the steps toward the light in his living room, I wasn't happy over the lack of information I had for him. But when I opened the door and saw what was waiting for me, that didn't matter. In one huge, beefy, freckled hand, there was the usual police department 38 revolver. Hello, kid. The ice-cold gray eyes, the thick, broken nose, the nasty curl of the lips. All belong to Bay City's toughest homicide detective, Lieutenant Rake Stallman. Hello, Marlowe. I've been waiting for you too long, kid. Why, I would have baked a little cake if I knew I was going to have this much time. Where's Ernie Parks, Stallman? He's under arrest, kid. We found his wife's body. He's under arrest for murder. You know what else, kid? No, what else, kid? How are you? He 
In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, Fred Allen's crack that it's no wonder comedians can't find work when singers go comical has had a fast reply from Bing Crosby. Bing has invited Fred to be his guest on his CBS show this Wednesday night. And you can get right into the very middle of the argument on most of these same CBS stations where Bing Crosby's show is every Wednesday night. Be sure to hear Fred Allen's visit to Bing's show this Wednesday, following Groucho Marx and You Bet Your Life. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Long Arm. Lieutenant Sturman moved toward me, curled the thick fingers of his left hand into a fist. I braced myself, but the blow never came. <laughs> Instead, he shoved his face up close to mine, and his mouth twisted into a one-sided grin that was as full of fun as a set of thumb screws. Well, you finally came through for me, didn't you, kid? I don't know what you're talking about. I've been waiting a long, long time for you to pull something in my town, Marlowe, where you can't run back across the line and hide behind the skirts of your cop friends over in L.A. You're having yourself a pipe dream, Sturman. Lieutenant Sturman! And don't forget it. Real sorry, officer. Now, do you mind explaining what this is all about? That's one of my rights as a citizen, you know, even in Bay City. As far as I'm concerned, killers ain't got any rights. Now tell me you had nothing to do with Grace Torch's murder, so I can tell you why you're a stinking liar, private detective. Now, I suppose private detectives have no rights either, huh? None. Ah. We found the girl's body in a car, parked at a vacant lot, and somebody overlooked a couple of fingerprints, which I'm going to match up with yours, Marlowe. How come you're so sure? Because we pulled Ernie Parch out of the movies five minutes after we found his wife. And jailbirds sing in Bay City, Marlowe. We don't horse around with him. Come on, let's go. Wait a minute. Boy, you pushed too far on the wrong track. There's an angle here you ought to know about. Uh, there's always an angle with you, ain't there, bright boy? Yeah, but you're going to like this one. First in that car you're so proud of, you're going to find Prince from one out Manelli. You gambler? That's right. One who stays in operation when everybody else in Bay City is closed up. You better find out whose toes you're stepping on down at City Hall before you start. Out! We got problems in our town, Peter, but that's not one of them. Now, if you got something intelligent to offer, spill it. Without wisecracks. All right. Any parts was framed a year ago in Manelli's joint. No doubt on Manelli's orders. Why? Because Grace Parts was a pretty girl with the end for gamblers. That's why. All the time Ernie was in the cooler, she was running down to Manelli's place, and I got a witness to prove it. It also makes it a kind of little cheap tramp that gets out of hand. Go on, detective! <clears throat> Nelly showed up here tonight. With no satisfactory reason for it. What's more, you warned Ernie Parts just this afternoon that you were keeping an eye on him. Even if he wanted to kill his wife, he's not stupid enough to have done it tonight. But from Nelly's standpoint, it was a perfect time, you see, because you guys would go for it just exactly as you have. So you think we're stupid? Uh, detective! <clears throat> Now, look, I, I know you got no use for me, Stuart. But you're a cop after all. And as long as somebody's got to take a rap, it might as well be the right guy. You know what, sweetheart? What? Your fairy story makes average listener. Just average, nothing else. Now get going! Too tired to take what I know I'd be given. Once Rex Terman got me inside the Bay City headquarters, I made my decision fast. There were three steps in the front porch of the wall, and he was right behind me. I took the first two, then turned and grabbed! Oh! He sailed over my shoulder, and I heard him land flat on his back on the sidewalk as I rounded the corner of the house. I crossed the backyard, bolted the fence, and put a hundred yards of alley between us before I even stopped to think. Then I went back to my car, drove down to the water again in Gomborski's chicken shanty. The place was dark and locked up tight. I went around to the back where his living quarters were and listened crocodile slithering over the floor inside would have made the same sound. I pushed the door open and went in. It was Gamborski, all right, but you couldn't tell it from his face. That had been worked over long and hard by an expert. He didn't know I was there until I touched him. Get away. Come on, get out of here. Who gave you the beating, Gumbo? Way off, will you please? Have I took enough already? All right, come on, get up. Oh. That's it. Now look, Gumbo. You told me one thing about Art Manelli, that Grace Parch went to his joint a lot. Yeah. And you spotted somebody outside the window and you clammed up. I come back now and I find you like this. Isn't it obvious you're wasting your time trying to protect him? Oh, shut up. Shut up and get out of here. Listen to me, you poor sap. 
Can't you see you're going to be living with this from now on? Every time he gets the jitters, he'll give you another going over to match this one. If he really gets jumpy, Buster, and then he'll do worse than that. Don't you get it? Oh, listen, mister, let's guess him. Well, I know what'll happen if I open my yap again. I'm just not going to take that chance. Don't you realize we'll never lick Manelli if we don't fight? Leave me alone. Hey, leave me alone. I'm not saying nothing. You understand nothing. Not one word. Now, get out. Come on, get out. All right, you miserable suck. I'm through talking to you. You'll think the other guy gave you a light massage by the time I'm through with you. Yeah, well, that's what you think. Hey, now, now stay where you are. I don't want to kill you, mister, but I will unless you beat it. I'd rather face that than talk. You're getting in too deep, aren't you, Gumbo? There's nothing else I can do. No nothing to me. I know which side my bread's buttered on. Yeah, but you made one big mistake already. Mistake? What? What do you mean? You left yourself wide open for this coffee pot. I'm sorry, sucker. But I don't have much time. Drop the gun. Come on. Drop it. That's better. Now just tell me one thing and I'll leave you alone. All I want to know is where I can locate Arpinelli right now. He's at his club, but they're a little casino. You're lying. I was down there. It's closed. It's being remodeled. I'm not. I'm not lying. All right. You need some more rubbing. <laughs> okay. Okay. He's got a suite of rooms downstairs under the club. They're not being done over. That's where he lives. He ought to be there now. But you've got to protect me. Storm and the Manali will kill me. Up. He'll kill me. That's all I want to know. So long, Gumbo. <laughs> At the first phone booth I came to, I stopped, looked up a Bay City number, and made a call, which took five minutes. Then I went on to the little casino. I parked on a side street, then went down the ramp to the underground garage in the rear. There was a door between two ornate bronze urns, Alibaba size, and I started toward it. But on a hunch, I stopped and studied the decoration on one of the urns. I finally found it. A small hole in the side. I took my handkerchief out and stepped into the hole. From somewhere inside the apartment, I heard a chime ring. I got my gun out and tried the door, and it opened. Into a long, lush hallway draped at the far end with a heavy gold curtain. I waded through a green carpet deep enough to mow up to the curtain and pulled it aside. Manelli sat at a wide, glossy desk, methodically filing his nails. His eyes staring straight at me. You got this far? Come on in. Don't tell me you're all alone here, Manelli. No, I got 500 dancing girls, smart guy. What's on your mind? You act like you were expecting me. I knew somebody was coming. There's an electric eye in those brass jugs out of the door. Anybody passes, it rings that chime there. Satisfied? Now what's with the gun? Put it away. In a minute, maybe. Seen Lieutenant Sturman tonight? Why? Should I? You've been rubbing elbows with homicide. But I didn't kill anybody. No, I guess you didn't. But I've got a good idea who did. There are any parts, of course. Uh uh-uh, uh, no, no chance. It was your business partner, Lieutenant Rake Sturman himself, and five will get you ten. He's got big news for you. Yeah. Hey, Rake. Steady, Marlowe. Don't move. Well, uh, look what crawled out of the woodwork. I'll get his gun, Rake. Sit down, Manelli. I'll take it myself. Yeah, that's better. Now, don't budge either one of you. Wait a minute. What is this? Shut up. You said you killed Grace Park. But you were in love with her. We used to meet her right here in this room. Yeah, that was before she found out a couple of things and began to put the pressure on me. We got in a brief to then. I lost my head. Now, shut up. Okay, Marlowe. Let's have it. How'd you dope it? How? And Borsky took a beating tonight just because he mentioned Manelli here. With a little more pressure, he mentioned someone else. You, Sturman. And why would you shut Gomborski up about Manelli unless you and Manelli were connected? That connection was all I needed. Uh-huh. Right on the button, sweetheart. For all the good it'll do you. Listen, I don't get this. I don't understand. You don't have to anymore. You're through. What are you saying, Ray? You know too much about me, Manelli. You know it all. Now, wait, you can't do this? Yes, I can. In fact, Marlowe here gave me the idea. He even worked out all the motives. So it's easy. I... I came here to arrest you for Grace Parch's murder. You you resisted, and I had to shoot you. <laughs> Ain't that a shame? But but about this Ernie Parch... I intended to hang it on him, Manelli, but he's nothing to me. I don't care if he lives or dies. But you, you're, you're getting too big for your britches anyway. So this is better, and I get three birds with one stone. Grace, Manelli, 
And you, Marlow. Uh, before you start pulling the triggers, Thurman, you better ask your boys. Huh? A couple of them are waiting for you behind that gold curtain there. Ah, you're a liar, Marlow. The electric guy would have tipped us off if anybody else came in. I blinded that eye with my handkerchief on my way in. That's right, Lieutenant what? Thurman. Dirty. How long you been there? Quite long enough. Better drop it, Lieutenant. I don't take orders from you, Sergeant. You do tonight. Chief himself sent us out. Yeah, I took the liberty of going over your head, Lieutenant, just before I came in. Under the circumstances, you'll understand. Why, right? you better drop it, Lieutenant. Drop it! Okay, now, come on. You two guys, too. Come along quietly. Sure, sure. Always glad to ride with old Rake's Terman any time at all. Just as long as there's a couple of policemen in the same car. <laughs> Before it was all over in the Bay City, police headquarters, everybody from the mayor, the dog catcher, had put his two cents in. And I'd given the same answers to the same questions at least 50 times. All about crooked cops and Rake Sturman in particular. But finally, hours later, I was free to go home. And as I drove through the quiet streets, I was still thinking about cops. This time, the other kind. The underpaid, overworked cops that pound the city sidewalks day and night. You know the guys who do everything from telling kids the way to the grocery store to untangling the rush hour traffic. Yeah. And I thought about each one of the cops who someday chases a hopped up gunman down a blind alley and doesn't get home that night. Or any night. Ever again. And then I forgot all about Rake's time. Because after all, he was just one bad one in a multitude of good ones. An insignificant sore on the long arm of the law. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald and are written for radio by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Barney Phillips, Ted Osborne, Sidney Miller, Tom Tully, and Bert Holland. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Arunt. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... It could have been perfect. Snowbound in a mountain lodge with a girl who was falling in love. But also present were a widow sick with rage, a bitter old woman, and a jealous man. All with reason to hate me more than anyone else in the world. <laughs> Two all-star bouts are promised on CBS this Wednesday night. Bing Crosby faces Fred Allen across the CBS mic to battle it out on who's funnier, singers or comedians. And in the second attraction, Gracie Allen and a smashed fender team up against not-so-gorgeous George Burns and a guilty conscience. This Wednesday also brings you Groucho Marx, his ad-libs, and his teams of opposites on You Bet Your Life, and a Dr. Christian story about two redheads in love. Fun, action, variety. They're all yours with Dr. Christian, Groucho Marx, Bing Crosby and Fred Allen, and George and Gracie on most of these same CBS stations this Wednesday night. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Now stay tuned for Pursuit, which follows immediately on most of these same CBS stations. This is CBS, where Wednesday night is Bing Crosby night, the Columbia Broadcasting System.